Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about this guy, Gregor Mendel, uh, who we credit for really coming up with the simple ideas behind genetics. Um, he worked in a monastery group. He plants, studied their characters or their characteristics, and then he would breed them, create a bunch of new pea plants. That's what each of these seeds in a pea pot is going to be. He would grow them and then see how those characteristics played out. And he came up with simple, we call it Mendelian genetics. Now, sadly, nobody really paid attention in his lifetime, and his work was rediscovered in the early 1900s. But we still give him credit for these ideas. And so I'm going to assume that you know some basic terms in genetics. And so let me flash these terms up here. And if there's some you don't understand, make sure you take a look at those. Okay, when I did this in class, there were a few stumpers. Uh, some kids were confused by the difference between a monohybrid and a dihybrid cross. Monohybrid cross would be something like this. If we're doing purple pea plants, if I'm crossing that with that, since I'm just studying one trait or one gene, we call that a monohybrid cross. Uh, a dihybrid cross would look something like this. Big P, little p, big Y, little y. So if I were to do a cross like this, this would be a dihybrid cross. Um, what's another one that was confusing? The independent assortment basically means that two different genes, for example, flower color and whether or not the seeds are wrinkled, those aren't going to affect each other. In other words, they assort independently, and that's going to take place in meiosis 1 as the homologous chromosomes separate. And then another term that some people are confused with is segregation. This is one of his big laws. It basically means that assuming that it's a diploid organism, if you are big P, little p, there's a 50% chance that you're going to give a sex cell a big P and a 50% chance it's going to give it a little p. Um, but most of the people in class kind of understood the other ones. Ah, oh, here's another one that was somewhat confusing. That's a test cross. Um, basically, if we have something that is big P, little p, or big P, big p, let's say this is a purple flower and this is a purple flower. In other words, I know the phenotypes of the two. Um, how do I figure out what the genotypes are? Well, basically, if you do a test cross, that means you're going to cross it with one that is homozygous recessive. You can imagine if I cross one that's homozygous recessive with this one, half of them are going to be purple. And if I cross it with this one, 100% of them are going to be purple. And so I can figure out what the genotype of these two are. And so those are some terms that you probably want to become familiar with before we dig a little bit deeper into genetics. But before Mendelian genetics, most people believed in this kind of a blending idea of genetics, that kids look a lot like their parents, and so there was something inside parents that's kind of blended together to make children. But they didn't really know what that was. And so the big discovery of Gregor Mendel was this. He took purple flowers. Now, these purple flowers were true breeding. What that meant is he crossed the purple flowers with themselves over and over and over and over again. And so what he had was purple flowers. And these ones, likewise, were white. And generation after generation, they only produced uh, white offspring. So he knew that we would call those pure, uh, pure, true breeding, purple and white flowers. He crossed those together. And so in the parental cross, he crossed purple with white. In the F1 generation, he basically got all purple flowers. Now, if you think about blended inheritance, this makes sense. If you take purple paint and mix it with white paint, it totally makes sense that you're going to get purple flowers. And so if he would have stopped here, he wouldn't have learned anything. But what he did then is took these ones and bred them with themselves. And what he found was this characteristic 3 to 1 purple to white uh, ratio. And this would be the phenotype ratio. And that white flower had come back. It had skipped a generation, but it was as white as that original white flower. And so that told him that something was being passed from generation to generation to generation. And the 3 to 1 ratio gave him some hints as to how that was actually passed. Um, if we were to write out how this works, and this is how he figured it out, well, the purple here would be big P, big P, homozygous, recessive. The, little, the whites are going to be little P, little P. And so if you think about it, if we cross these two, all of this generation is going to be big P, little p. And then if I cross this with itself, we could do a Punnett square, but basically one out of the four is going to be big P, big P. We're going to have two of them be big P, little p, and then we're going to have one of them be little p, little p. But since purple is dominant, if you have one purple, that means you're going to be dominant. That's why these three right here ended up being purple. And this one ended up being white. And so that's pretty much what he had formulated, and it's held to this day. So he basically talked about two Mendel's laws, or two laws. And basically, they are the law of segregation. Law of segregation means that each 
organism is going to have two genes for each trait. So this one is going to have a gene for purple and another gene for purple. In this case, it's heterozygous, so it's got one big P, one little p. And so the law of segregation is just like flipping a coin. Basically what you're doing is flipping a coin on each of these genes. There's a 50% chance that the gamete um, or the next generation is going to get the big P and there's a 50% chance that it's going to get the little P. And so the law of segregation isn't scary. It basically means everything's coin flip. And there's a coin flip on each gene. Next thing he discovered was the idea of independent assortment. And so basically once you've discovered genes, the big thing we have to figure out then are do our genes tied together? In other words, this one, and please remember these letters because they'll come up in just a second. This is a yellow pod and then this would be a green pod. We'd normally use the, the capital letter to represent the dominant trait. In this case, it's yellow. And then the recessive letter is going to be the green. And then this one would be round seeds and this would be wrinkled seeds or wrinkled pods, we could say. And so basically this is going to be the dominant and this is the recessive. And so what he wanted to study, and this is what he studied in his traits, is are these two linked? Are they tied together? Or do they assort independently? And independent assortment basically says that the yellow versus green is not going to affect the round versus wrinkled. In other words, these two genes segregate. These two genes are separate. Now we'll find that once we get into a little bit of chromosomal genetics, sometimes they will be linked together, but independent assortment means that genes don't affect each other. The yellow versus green and the round versus wrinkled assort independently. So what do you use uh, to solve these? Well, a simple way to do it is just doing simple probability and using a Punnett square. And so if you're not sure what a Punnett square is, basically, let's say that we have big P, little p here. Since we have the law of segregation, half of the gametes or half of the sex cells are going to get the big P and half are going to get the little p. We now know that that's called segregation. And so really what the two sides on the top are going to represent are the different gametes that we have. Likewise, let's say we're copying this with little p, little p, then this is going to segregate as well. So these are going to be the two different p's that you can get. And then what does the middle represent? Well, the middle represents fertilization. These are all the possibilities that you could get when these two alleles that separated come back together again. And so let's try some of these kind of in your head. So you could stop if you want to, but let's say we take this, purple with white. So if you were to do a Punnett square for that, how many different genotypes am I going to get? And the right answer should be one, big P, little p. And how many physical phenotypes am I going to get? Just one. Let's try the next one, kind of in your head. If we do this cross, how many genotypes would I get? Well, I'm going to get three genotypes, um, big P, big P, big P, little p, little p, little p. How many phenotypes am I going to get? Well, I'm only going to get two physical phenotypes. So I'm only going to get purple and white. Let's try the next one. Let's say here, how many different genotypes would I get? Right answer, I'm going to get two different genotypes. How many phenotypes? Just one. They're all going to be yellow. Or this one, when I'm mixing round with round, how many genotypes will I get? Two. How many phenotypes am I going to get? I'm just going to get one. They're all going to be round. And so if you're struggling with the Punnett squares, you may want to always, on a monohybrid cross like this, work it out. When in doubt, work it out. So now let's go through some sample problems. So I'll read it, then quickly come up with an answer, and then I'll tell you what the right answer is. So a coin is flipped four times, comes up heads each time. What's the probability the next coin flip will come up heads? Right answer should be one in two, or half of the time. So basically what I'm getting at here is all these earlier events aren't going to affect the next event. Let's go a little uh, easier. Classify the following as heterozygous or homozygous. Right answer should be, uh, this would be homozygous, this would be heterozygous, this would be homozygous, and this is going to be heterozygous for the first trait, homozygous for the second. We could get a little more specific. This would be homozygous dominant, this would be homozygous recessive, this would be heterozygous, and sometimes we call that hybrid. Let's go to the next one. What's the phenotype of the following? Phenotype, remember, is physically what do they look like. I would call this one yellow, this one round, this one green, and this one's going to be yellow and round. Let's go to another one. What's the probability of this cross, big R, little r, big R, little r, producing wrinkled seeds? Right answer is going to be one-fourth, or a one in four probability, or 25% chance. And that's going to be each of them. It's a one-half probability on each of the little r's. Let's go to another one. What's the probability of these producing green seeds? 
I would say one in two. These ones are always gonna give the recessive trait. This one's gonna give the recessive trait half of the time, so it's gonna be a one in two probability. And now let's go to the last one. What's the probability that this parent and this parent would produce this? Take a second, see if you could do that one in your head. Okay, if you can't do it in your head that fast, you probably don't know the law of uh, multiplication. And it's really simple. Don't try to do a Punnett square. If it's ever a dihybrid cross, the way you solve it is this. Let's start on the R's. And so if we have this R and this R, what are the odds that we're gonna produce this R? Well, if you're confused, you could always do a little Punnett square, so I could write it out like this, big R, little R, crossed with big R, big R. And so that's gonna be big R, big R, big R, big R. Big R, little r, big R, little r. So the odds that we're going to produce this, you can see, is a 2 and 4 or a 1 half probability. So you just write 1 half underneath this one. What are the odds with this parent and that parent that we're going to produce that? Right answer is going to be, you could do a Punnett square, but you should be able to do this one in your head, a 1 half. And since we have to get both of these, so we have to get this and that, then you multiply the two together. And so the right answer would be 1 in 4. Now, if you were to do this as a Punnett square on a dihybrid cross, it's going to take you minutes and minutes to just set it up, and you're probably going to screw up how to do the meiosis. And so always do the uh, law of multiplication if you have a dihybrid cross. And this goes all the way out to a trihybrid. All of those are simple, easy to do with multiplication. And I've put together a video on the law of multiplication in addition, how it can be applied in genetics. But that's Mendelian genetics. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to talk more about advanced or non-Mendelian genetics. But for now, I hope that's helpful.